Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic Indie Crater interview. It's your Cape Crusader, Cody, and we are keeping it geekly once again with our returning friend, Richard Fairgrave. We're here to break down Shed and everything in between, but before we even begin, Richard, welcome back to the show. How have you been since you last been on, man? I mean, exhausted, as always. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, uh, my, my, my life motto is look great, feel terrible. Uh, <laughs> and to be honest, I'm crushing it. Yeah, yeah, dude, I, I've seen you like just killing it and left and right coming out with, I, I was like just amazed. I, I thought I was a workhorse, but then I've seen your work ethic. We were talking about this backstage and it's like, dude, holy crap. Like I thought like four to six hours of sleep was like, was was like, if I got four, I felt crap. You're like, dude, that's my minimum. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, that's that's like what I have to do. It's a like stop work at midnight, be asleep by 12.30, get up at 4.30. And, you know, I got I got some shit the other day because people have this idea of like, what's your morning routine? You know, like I do my yoga or I make this special coffee that takes a long time to brew. And I'm like, no, I, I, I microwave my coffee from the night before mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I've perfected it that I can make a new pot of coffee in the minute 32 that I microwave my old coffee. And then uh, I turn the, the new pot on and walk immediately to my desk and start drawing. And then I do that until midnight. Like there's there's no there's no fun outside of that. There's like everything is sort of designed to keep me at my desk and never looking away unless I absolutely have to, which is usually to like go to get more art supplies. I mean, but dude, left and right, like I said, you've been pumping out work and it's just it's so insanely detailed. It's 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 remarkable because uh, you're you're legally blind, right? Like the yeah. the fact that you're you're producing this work in such like insane details is is just remarkable in itself. Well, I sort of I approach every book as if like, hey, maybe this will be the one that kills me, <laughs> and like I'm always sort of excited to find out. You know, I don't I'm not not saying I want to die because I don't want to die. I do want to be a ghost, but I don't want to die. But like I'm always curious when I'm like, hey, I didn't. You know, it's like. So like right before we went live, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I found something on my desk and I was like, I wonder if that's food. It wasn't. I don't know what it was, but I know it wasn't food because I ate it, but I'm alive, you know, <laughs> and so I got I, that I, experience. I was doing pre-show stuff. It's like, imagine my reaction. I come back and you're just like slumped over dead. I'm like, dude, what just happened? <laughs> Here, here's the thing. I thought, I thought it was a piece of a taco. It was like a piece of a taco shell. It's quite large. Um, tasted a lot like sort of like a soggy fish, but maybe just like paper. I don't know. What kind of parties are you doing over there, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> so let's give a little bit of a breakdown of who you are. And mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have a previous video, which we're going to have pop up in the post-production video right at this moment right here. So... Um, Skipping ahead, I, I guess, a little bit. Let's talk about some of your, your recent works that you've been working on as well. Okay, so uh, what just wrapped up was Haunted Hill, which ran for 12 issues online, um, which was my... Uh, I don't want to say I've ever written a love letter to anything, but if I had, it would be this. My love letter to Hollywood. It's about a 35-year-old dirtbag who uh, has moved back to Hollywood because her wife got a really good museum job she couldn't turn down. And it was this, like weird sprawling but incredibly condensed story of like 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 literally 12 issues that took place over i think 28 hours where mm -hmm. we just never left this character alone to see how she would problematize every single moment of her life from like what should have been a 10 minute ride home turns into several hours what should be just like hey you know okay look so you, you stole a, you accidentally stole a laptop that has a sex tape on it of, of someone you met but also maybe you don't need to masturbate to that um, yeah, it's like, like just a constant stream of, 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 of being human garbage, um, that was largely inspired by my own life. Um, uh, I've never stolen, I know that's, I have stolen a laptop, but I've never, um, <laughs> never then used that laptop for masturbation. So that's where it diverges. Um, <laughs> the glory and, holes though were real though. I remember that. <laughs> I mean, so much of it was like, so people, many glory holes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that. If, 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 if anyone has read Haunted Hill, uh, it's all free on RichardFairgrave.com. All 12 issues are up there. Uh, page four, I think, you can see the top of my husband's head as he's uh, rimming someone in a sling. So it's a, it's a classy book, is what I'm saying. 
Um, hi, Chilton's author Richard Fagg right here. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say you were just sharing a tweet earlier of a, a child holding a book that you uh, that you wrote. I, uh, um, I thought that was awesome as well. I Black Sea Sand, wrote... right? Or uh, Black Sea uh, Beach, right? Uh, Black, Black Sand, Sand Beach. Beach. Yeah. I um, knew so it was right on the tip of my tongue. Volume three of that came out last, since last time we spoke. Uh, that came out in uh, June or July. Paper shortages make everything all over the place. Uh, and volume four is about half finished at this point. I have to finish drawing it by the end of this year. Uh, no pressure. Um, and what else have I done? I mean, here's the thing, you know, like, yeah, you're right. There's a picture of a kid holding up a copy of my book and they're delighted because they have this book that is for kids. And for a long time, I got really like freaked out of like, I cannot do, um, I cannot be like public about what a, you know, what garbage I am. And I cannot, uh, put like my more adult material out into the world because it, there's, you know, I, like I have to make a choice of which lane I'm in. Mm -hmm. And then I realized like, no, I don't. Like there are plenty of authors who get to do both. The only difference now is like, and, and, and have done both for a long time. The difference now is we have social media, but you know who's not on social media? Kids. Yeah. And like, you know who's never gonna like, okay, fine. Kids are probably on TikTok or whatever has replaced TikTok by the time this video comes out. And it's, I, I, that's, a, that is a deliberate joke because we're live. Um, I'm never going to be on TikTok because I went on TikTok for about four minutes and I was like, I feel like the oldest person in the fucking room. Um, so no, no, thank you. I will stay on Twitter with the other elderly people talking about my, my, my dirty grown up books. Um, or not even necessarily dirty, my like emotionally complicated dramas or my weird atmospheric horrors that are probably not going to appeal to the same audience as the thing about the haunted beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's almost like why hide that part of yourself, too? Like, do we want to teach children to do that, to, to hide them parts of themselves to fit to some norm that society deems is right? Like, not to go on a tangent myself, but... I mean, absolutely, we do. If you look at my TED Talk, you'll see... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, of course we don't, but it was... I, what, what was happening is I was getting a lot of pressure from uh, my publishers because... At, there was a point, I guess six years ago now, where I was also doing picture books, like mm -hmm. three to six year olds. I had uh, 11 of those and they were doing very well and I was doing a lot of interviews about them, but there was starting to be this weird bleeding between things where I would get an email asking me to do an interview and I would never have any context of, am I doing this interview about, um, you know, my grandpa is a dinosaur or am I doing this interview about, uh, you know, whatever complicated grown-up thing I was doing at the time. And I would then find myself with like, oh no, I mean, I mean even right now, like we've got, like sh the Shed Kickstarter finishes this Thursday and then next week a new book is being announced uh, that I shouldn't talk about, but it's gonna be real good. Um, and Ooh. then I think a week after that, another book comes out that got delayed from, I wanna say May because of paper shortages. And it's like, Am I meant to be I, like all my publicity seems to like roll into one spot and suddenly I'm I, I'll find myself on an interview for getting halfway through what I'm talking about and switch into be like, yeah, so my husband's rimming this guy in the sling on page four of my book. And they're like, do you mean page four of your picture book, Richard? Yeah, so, all the children are like, what does that mean? <laughs> I, so I got uh, this is years ago. I got asked to design um, a poster for a, a big fisting event. Um, and uh, I posted about it on Facebook. And then about two hours later, my mother called me and she's like, I saw your post on Facebook. I didn't know what fisting was. So now I've read the Wikipedia. So thanks for that, I guess. So, you know, there's, there, there can be some weird crossover <laughs> accidents. So how does this, you know, end up becoming shed? How did you end up coming into this project? This is the first project that you've ever been a part of that has been a Kickstarter. Everything else was like either published or self-published, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have kind of I've avoided Kickstarter for years because uh, I, I've also avoided digital comics for years. You know, I, I, I full disclosure, I've never read a digital comic. Um, if, if you're ever under the impression that like, people who have sent me things being like, hey, can you read my comic and like give me feedback or whatever? And I'm like, absolutely I can, I'll print it out. And I'll read it on paper like a grown-up. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't think people would appreciate knowing that. Like sometimes, you know, you and I, we have some mutual friends who do like truly beautiful comics that have 
uh, stunning artwork that will look really nice printed one day. And I do not think that my HP Envy is doing it justice when I print out <laughs> uh, objects in the mirror to read. You know, um, so, so that's a little bit different though, right? You can't control the, the resolution of that screen. So, I mean, it, it makes sense like that you would want to print it out and, and look at it. Yeah, it's also that like I never have any time. So if I'm if I'm going to be reading a comic, it's probably going to be like either on the toilet um, or like when I'm in a car or something. I'm not gonna. I don't want to read it on my phone. I don't want to mm -hmm. take a laptop with me. So I will just take a, 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 a wad of stacks of paper and you know, uh, <laughs> like an idiot. Um, but so I, yeah, I've never done Kickstarter also because like my background is all conventions. Like I, I made my living from conventions for years and years and years. And uh, I never really felt like there was a crossover between my audience from there and the internet. But apparently everyone has the internet. Um, and so apparently that I was just very, very wrong and stupid is what it all comes down to. Um, Shed happened, it was right at the beginning of COVID. Uh, my friend Lucy and I, who'd like collaborated on a bunch of stuff for years, we used to have a podcast called In the Kitchen at the Party with the Wine, where the idea was like all the best conversations in the world happen in kitchens at parties, drinking wine late at night, usually with strangers. And you have those like incredible deep connections because there's nothing, uh, you can both walk away at the end of it and never see each other, no matter how much you insist you're going to. And so you can be fully open and fully honest. So Lucy and I decided to see if we could, as close friends, capture that exact same magic while being in separate places. And so we recorded this podcast from different cities um, to try and see if we could we could find our way to like the perfect human conversation. Um, and like we kind of it, it 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 wasn't a very good podcast to be honest, uh, but it it we bonded like so hard and like got so inside each other's heads through it um just by having these like two hour conversations every week mm -hmm. that didn't have a prompt or didn't have a reason other than that we wanted to talk and um so then when i was uh thinking about pitching this other kid's book cardboardia uh i thought well i should just get lucy to write that with me because that would be fun and we're not doing the podcast anymore so this will give us another reason to talk to each other all the time um, Lucy and I never live in the same city, so we've always like, we, we, I think we have for like a few months at a time at different points, but we're always on opposite sides of the world. Mm -hmm. And so we'd, we'd been working on Cardboardia and then we were in between books on that and we were very kind of fed up with that whole situation. Um, and so I said to her, well, you know, COVID had just happened now, oh, by no, so, so long story longer. She had just moved to London when COVID hit. So she'd been like, I think following Louis Tomlinson around on tour for a little bit um, and then going to weird Christmas markets. And then she was like, I'm now back in London. I've got my visa to be here for two years. I'm going to get like a really good job. And then she got a really good job. And then the next day COVID happened oh. and then the job went away. And then she was like living in a, in a youth hostel and trying to find a place to rent while everyone was in lockdown and trying to find a new job and rapidly running out of money and also just like being very uh, bored because she didn't have a community in London yet because she just arrived. And so I said to her like, I can't help with most of that, but we could write another book. And I was working on this uh, um, script for a graphic novel at the time where the, I mean, I'm not gonna give it all away, but low key premise is that the only reason anyone goes looking for Sasquatch is to have secret gay sex in the woods. Um, and <laughs> Uh, we got really into that and then I decided I wanted to do that one on my own because like it goes some places that will be very fun for me to like explore in strange ways um, and so we started writing this, this other thing about uh, being we're both you know we're both people who have like left our home country and moved far away mm -hmm. and we have both regularly had the experience of having to go home for things and uh, there's a, a fairly even mix between people who are delighted to see us and want to hear about everything we've done and want to reconnect with us as friends and people who uh, hold some resentment in place for the fact that we left. Like yeah. we are no longer part of their inner circle, but we should want, they expect that we should want to be. And so we wanted to capture that like very 
Um, you know, th there are plenty of stories out there about someone who moves away and comes back and has changed and different, but trying to capture that very specific, like, uh, when I'm writing drama, I always try and think of like, what does the character think they want and what do they really want? And then the, the internal conflict happens when those two things meet. And so having this idea of like wanting to be, I want to fit in with my friends and I want everyone to like me, but really what I want is just to get the fuck out of here. Um, I think creates a cool thing. So we started writing a whole thing. It was like a, a graphic novel set at, across one weekend at a theme park location wedding. And we got into like crazy character drama and we had all these wonderful set pieces, with various like carnival rides and things. Mm -hmm. um, and different characters being split into different groups and trapped in different rides as they broke and that kind of stuff. And it was like very, like very fun. And I, I looked at Lucy one day and I was like, hey, I have to fucking draw this though. And I don't want to draw a goddamn roller coaster. That sounds, that sounds like hell. Oh my God. Yeah. And all the support beams and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and you know, because it was a very grounded, very realistic story, it would have to be grounded, realistic art. I would have to really learn how to draw a fucking roller coaster. Cut to like a year and a half later, and I'm sitting here being like, well, I'm drawing this thing set inside an abandoned house, and I've got to make sure I know which floorboards are broken so I can always draw them in the correct places and where the stains are on the walls and this complicated staircase that goes like, I remember so, yeah, seeing I, your tweet about the staircase. It looks good, though. It looks I've got, beautiful. I've got 22 more pages set on that staircase. <laughs> like, I've had to, um, I've had to switch to a different desk so I can do my uh, perspective lines far enough away. I've got like the, the the pages taped in place, which is horrible for me because I'm like a person who turns my pages on mm -hmm. all the time. But I have like pins on either end of the desk with strings coming off them to do my perspective lines, and just it's it's insane. Um, but it'll get done. Um, anyway, uh, so, so I said, I don't want to do that. Let's like, let's put that on hold. We can write it as a film script or we can write it as a script for someone else to draw later. But like, I need something to occupy my time right now because I'm drawing Haunted Hill, but I'm managing like three pages a day of art on that one. And I finished my memoir and I need to, like, I, I am so bored because we're in lockdown. And, mm -hmm. you know, that first lockdown when, when it was real, real intense lockdown and you had to spray all your food with poisons and things. Um, and then one day Lucy said, what about someone who works in a junk shop? That sounds like it would be really hard to draw, but you'd be able to find interesting things to draw in it. So maybe it wouldn't be as bad. And I was like, 100% sold. Yeah, and then <laughs> like th this is how everything goes with Lucy and I. We just kind of like meander around these ideas until we find like the piece we want, and then we just pull that thread for as long as we possibly can. And we wanted to do something about like we're both in our thirties, but there is this point we both went through in our late twenties where we felt this is the point in our life where we should be um, settling down. We should be looking for the, the the happy ending for our lives because we've seen that on TV a lot, mm -hmm. and. We escaped that, which we're very glad of, but I think a lot of people fall into that trap still. And so we wanted to do it, have a character who, who, where that was her her position. Like she'd had her wild few years and now she wanted a quiet, peaceful life where she would move to a small seaside town. And at the same time, I was booked in for a colonoscopy. Okay. And this is relevant because obviously when they went to put that camera up my butthole, I said, no, thank you to the anesthetic. I would like to be awake because I want to film it. And so I have a lot. If you ever need footage of the inside of my colon, you just like anyone, just hit me up. I've you know, got maybe a lot. <laughs> maybe like a tra like a transition to like you know campaigns and stuff. We just like travel through Richard's butthole. Here is the really now. I, I will say, I will say they do not turn the because I'm I'm lying facing away from I'm facing away from my butthole uh, just to get into the physics of it. Um, and so I'm. I'm holding up my my phone to film the screen in front of me. So we're just watching you get penetrated by this. Long time. Well, so but they don't turn the camera on on their device until it's fully inside. So you don't even get a warning, which I guess is what the anesthetic is for. Um, but one, I'm surprisingly ribbed in there. I assume that's normal, but holy shit, I would not have expected. Did the light like shoot out of your mouth like when you opened up? Were you like a, like a Richard flashlight? The, well, actually, we found out that my my dead eye works for something. <laughs> oh that was good all right <laughs> but, so, so i'm filming this colonoscopy and 
I get this idea, I, and so I send the first clip to Lucy while I'm like in in the moment, and I'm like, "Hey, this is the inside of my butt." <laughs> Great comic idea, by the way. <laughs> um, but what if we wrote like just while we're while we're in this writing phase? Uh, what about a kids' book that was all set in the dark and was just you we use the inside of my butt as the background or as an inspiration for the background because we draw it obviously. Um, but it's about a person trying to escape from a sea monster. And it's a person who's been swallowed by a sea monster finding the way out. Um, and uh, again, I wasn't in the best position. So maybe like it is very derivative of Magic School Bus, I guess. But um, Arnold was not a sea monster. He should have been. That would have been a better book. Um, but like, so this was, so suddenly we were thinking about sea monsters anyway. And then we decided like, well, okay, so we've got this woman moving to the small seaside town. There should be a sea monster there. Everyone should use, should have gone to see the sea monster. And then from that, the tourism has dried up because the pier uh, shut down and then the pier burnt down or the pier hasn't been rebuilt since it burnt down because they don't have the money, but was the pier shut down before? And that's all about that. Like we started, we, we had so many threads of what the town was and what it used to be that we started realizing where did we get this information or where could Amber, our main character, get this information? It's from the people of the town. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly we start creating this web of lies and stories of a sea monster, which are obviously lies as well. And so we're getting these, mul like the, the whole story is like a big tangled mess of different people's versions of what the story should be. Um, it's told in a very like straightforward, clean way, but like everything is sort of, every character is influenced by what they it's believe. It's like, um... Like, what what was it the the telephone thing i forgot what it's called but you tell someone about a zebra and by the like the 10th person they tell you it's about a horse mm -hmm. like the, the the trail of like mis uh information leading from one person to, to the next yeah and so then if you have that as like an ingrained part of the reality of this town um you can never really know who you're going to like you have to choose who you're going to trust or who you want to believe because sometimes the story is nicer than like yeah, the, the pier burnt down. We're all working together to get it rebuilt. Uh, that's a nice idea. That's very Stars Hollow. But hey, the pier shut down a long time ago because no one came to it and it fell into disrepair. And then it burnt down one day. That's just a really sad story about a shitty town that has no hope. You know, it's the it's the um, the artist who put the bull on Wall Street as a protest against like the on oncoming storm that is capitalism mm -hmm. and uh it was you know it was it was a, a, a criticism of the finance sector right and then they bring in this like uh new statue of a little girl standing up in front of the bull because like girls are very powerful and they can defeat a big powerful bull and she's not afraid and so to some people that's like cool cool like strong girl messaging good and maybe to you know a kid out there that is great and they see that and they're like i'm inspired by that but then when you scratch the surface a little bit the first statue was placed there by an artist who didn't receive any money for it and he put it there as a protest the statue of the girl was put there to announce a new stock being launched with the initials s-h-e so like one of those things is just a piece of actual capitalism that is um, taking advantage of the idea of people being inspired by a girl being strong and the other one's actual art that mm -hmm. is in direct opposition to this thing. But you can't say, take the girl away, it sucks, because then you're saying, take the girl away, it sucks. And like, and, like it's, you know, and people who are, I think we like to think these things happen by accident because it helps us sleep at night to think that no one's really planning this. But someone definitely looked at that and they were like, you know what, this artist put this bowl here, it's basically free. We, If we put a little girl statue here to advertise our thing, it'll get a lot of coverage. Oh, someone definitely and, got paid to do that. You know, someone yeah. definitely like, you know, yeah. And no one, like that artist can never take his bowl away because then he's the monster. Yeah. Uh, wow, That what a way to kind of get like, blocked into uh, like the anti-message you know almost like like the opposite of what you were trying to relay yeah and and um I, I really love the kind of um i love getting stuck deep in the nuance of things like that um that's a fun that's a fun place to try and puzzle your way out of right because mm -hmm. uh, there is no answer there's like it sucks for everyone 
Um, and, I, and so, so Shed kind of has uh, that same kind of thinking behind it of, of like, there are so many different pieces that mean so many different things. But then at the core of it, much in the way of the Wall Street thing, it's shitty capitalism. At the core of Shed, it is a shitty, small-minded, bigoted town who are using all of these stories to hold on to something that they used to be and insisting that everything stays exactly as it was because of control and fear. Wow, that, you know, that is some really deep, you know, concepts uh, to, to put within the story. I think right now, let's go ahead and use this time to segue over to the Kickstarter. Let's take a look at the Kickstarter a little bit in depth and we can kind of break down more of the story over there. Cool. So where you're looking at shed small towns and large sea monsters, it doesn't matter if it's happy, if all you're looking for is an ending. Small towns and small mines versus big dreams and big lobsters. Currently at $4,990 of a goal of $1,049. 299 backers in three days left to go. Congratulations. Uh, also project we love. Hell yeah, man. Uh, for for this being the first Kickstarter that you're a part of, like you killed it. Yeah, it, it felt kind of wild. Like, like we funded in just over two hours as well, which was an intense morning for me. Yeah, and that, that is awesome. Let's go ahead and watch this YouTube video and uh, kind of get a little bit uh, better of an idea of what we're here for. <laughs> I really love just how stubborn this old lady was too in the beginning. Yeah, she was kind of my favorite. We actually we, we didn't know uh, when we first started. We thought she was going to be a minor character, and then I was like, she's too fun to draw. She's too fun to write about. I just like having old ladies say fuck a lot. <laughs> That was awesome. I, I, that music went like perfect. So by the way, for anyone watching, here is the link once again. If you're unable to back, a simple retweet on Facebook or Twitter goes a long way. And you might have a friend who is going to love this story. Um, so yeah, dude, this art was awesome. There is a free 20, I think it's 21 pages uh, preview. Um, just if you scroll down, you could check this story out for free to see if you're going to like it. And I thought that was a really awesome way to kind of let people like get a taste of what this graphic novel is about. Yeah, it's a weird thing as well. Like I think... Um, I, I spend so much time backing things on Kickstarter where I have no idea how long the thing's going to be. Um, and uh, full disclosure, I get every, everything is much cheaper if I get it sent to my my place in the US and I'm stuck up in, up here in Canada right now. And so I think I have like 50 books from Kickstarter that I have no idea the length of. And so when uh, Blue Fox approached us and asked like, do you want to do this through Kickstarter? We said, sure. They wanted to like put out the, I think they wanted to put it out in three issues um, with two chapters per issue. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'll just finish the whole book. That's fine. Um, because at the time, I genuinely thought like, well, no one, no one would ever want to back a single issue on here. Everyone would want to buy the whole thing, wouldn't they? They wouldn't, mm -hmm. they wouldn't wait around for it. So uh, I may have, I have overshot on that a little, but it means people get 132 pages of, uh, of, of a graphic novel for like 11 British dollars. Yeah, that is remarkable. That is remarkable. So the story so far is after the death of her father, Amber seeks refuge in his small town, reopening his junk shop and looking for the happy ending she's seen in so many movies. The one where a young woman relocates and dates two men. The one where you know exactly what you'll do for the rest of your life by the time you hit 30. The one that shouldn't be examined too closely by anyone who slumped into it. So let's go ahead and before we take a look at some of these stretch goals, um, do you have uh, the tiers like on the side? Uh, are there images that coincide with that? 
Uh, there are not. Okay, I always just double check so that way when I'm scrolling, you know, I don't have to scroll two, uh, two at the same time. So for, uh, and I'm gonna refer to these as US dollar too. It'll be a little bit easier for me. Um, but for every, everyone that's watching, the, the, the pound uh, is gonna be right above it. So for 16 bucks, the early bird shed, uh, is this still available? I don't think so. Oh, no, no, it's it's okay, I, I'm scrolling all the way at the bottom, my bad. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay. <laughs> um, so for five, or for six dollars USD, you can get the Shed PDF. Uh, for uh, 13 dollars, you're gonna get the physical graphic novel, which is pretty outstanding. You said it was how many pages? 132. Wow, you, you th this is like right on like a lot of books that are like 20 pages. So that is a pretty outstanding price. You know, what was some of your reasoning for going with that pricing? Um, I... I have always like because because I come from like children's publishing. Um, I really like making comics as cheap as I possibly can. So uh, I I knew what the pricing structure was at Blue Fox when I signed up with them. Um, and so I, I sorry I'm getting distracted by a dog. No, you're ordering. good. You're good. Um, I, I I knew that they would they went with that kind of pricing, and I thought that seemed pretty good to me because I want as many people to get the book as possible. You know, it's the same reason that I put like. Like, I think one of our stretch goals, if we get to, oh no, I think we, we, we've reached our, our second stretch goal was that people are gonna get an 800 page, 800 pages of, of uh, digital comics from me. Uh, every backer at every level gets 800 pages because That's I just awesome. like comics being cheap or free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Richard ain't gonna read them if they're digital, but take advantage of that. Yeah, other page. people can read them. <laughs> other people have way better eyesight than me. And no, that's true, welcome. true, touche, touche. You're welcome to print them out on your HP Envy and sit in a car or a toilet and read them for yourself. Oh my God, eight, a bundle of just 800 pages too. <laughs> <laughs> so for $18, you're gonna get the PDF and the physical uh, edition bundled together. And that's it. So let's mm -hmm. go ahead and take a look at some of these stretch goals. We have Lee Newman. Uh, this campaign is very well executed and the book looks really polished, great work. Thanks for stopping in, Lee. We really appreciate that. It's good to see you in here, man. Thanks, Lee. So some of the stretch goals at 3K, uh, you're gonna get the lobster sticker. So what's the story behind the lobster? Is there, is, does, does it play a big part? Um, so I've always been interested in uh, the, like the, the, the mythology of the lobster. I don't know whether this stuff is true or not. Uh, but years and years and years ago, my friend Theo and I wrote a book called Kaiju Crunch. And it's just a little eight page story about two kids talking about uh, why they're scared of lobsters. And it's because lobsters don't age and their cells don't degenerate. And unless a lobster is actually killed by something, a lobster will just live forever growing larger and larger. And so there's a possibility that there could be a lobster the size of a car or a bus or a house, or you, we could all be on top of a giant lobster right now and not know it. And that's a fair point. <laughs> that's very exciting to me as a as, as a visual uh, for things. And but, you know, because the book is about so many different kinds of sea monsters, um, and because everyone's story is inconsistent, we have a kraken, we have a, a, a kind of sea serpent, we have a Loch Ness monster type. Like we have all the different uh, marine cryptids. Um, but I wanted to kind of put the idea of like, what is the deeply human, uh, deeply personal feeling one? It's the lobster, the one that like, that when it's tiny, it could, it has all this potential and we trap it. We lure it to the seaside and we trap it in a pot and then we boil it to death slowly so it doesn't even notice. Like the, the lobster is, is, is the metaphor for Amber or what potentially could happen to Amber if she stays in this town. Um, and at the same time, they're just really fucking fun to draw. And so there's this continued motif throughout the story. Each chapter cover is a lobster in a different stage of its life cycle, be it That's swimming so cool. freely in the water to being cooked and eaten. That's so cool. So at 4,000 or 4.5 4. thousand, and that's in pound, by the way, um, uh, we're going to get hundreds of pages of free digital comics by Richard Fairgray. Now, is this the first time that Blastosaurus has been available like this? Because I remember we talked beforehand and I, if I if memory serves me, well, it wasn't like readily available. Or so there for was... a long time, it wasn't. Um, the, the, there's the 800 pages will include the full New Zealand run of Blastosaurus, my original run, uh, 15 issues and five specials. Um, and it's there's a really shitty low res version that I managed to find. Uh, uh, there, long story short, um, don't go to Disneyland with your new boyfriend uh, while you're still connected to your ex on social media because they might have your Dropbox password and get jealous and delete a bunch of your files. 
Oof. Yep. Uh, but long story longer, I found a hard drive that I didn't know about and it, I cracked that bad boy open and it turns out there's like a buttload of my old files on there that were like print quality. Uh, so I've managed to get back the old Blastosaurus. Um, there's my 24 hour comic book day where Blastosaurus has sex with Paul Eiding. Uh, there's going to be the first issue of my memoir, the first issue of Haunted Hill, um, the American version of Blastosaurus, a graphic novel called Anorex and Acolytes, the first issue and first and only issue of Boy and Sea, my book about a little boy who steals a book. I love that name so her. much. Every time I see it, dude, it's just like such a perfect title. Um, I'll have like a, a handful of short comics that I've done for different things. Uh, and like, it's just going to be like a kind of a, a buck wild array of, mm -hmm. of, of things. Um, I was really trying to get to a thousand pages, but uh, there's not really an easy way for me to do that when I'm this busy. So 800 will have to do. No, I dude, 800 is a remark to holy crap. Well, everyone else has these digital comic bundles where they get everyone else to, to, to give issue ones of things. And I didn't have time to organize it. So I'm like, shit, I'll do it all myself. <laughs> Fine, I'll do it myself. Uh, <laughs> at 5,000, we have a, a stretch goal that is locked still. So this is going to be the Sea Monster postcard with a gigantic lobster. Wish I wasn't here. I love that, too. That is such a perfect play on the name. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy, like, I hate bookmarks uh, in campaigns. Um, I, I don't want to I don't want to receive garbage when when I open an envelope, um, but I love postcards because then I always have the potential that I could send someone a postcard. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. That is true. And like we said, guys, if you're interested, right here is the link once again. There is a free uh, 2021 page uh, sample. It is, is remarkable. It is a fun read. Uh, I really love the art style, Richard. You kill it all the time with the art. I just noticed this was a gigantic lobster claw coming out of the sea right here. I didn't, I, I don't know how I missed that the first time, but like looking at it, I guess, zoomed in, I could see it now. Well, that's kind of, you're kind of meant to miss it. Um, so it, it worked. Um, <laughs> I like the idea that there is, there is like panel one of this thing has the explanation that, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I, I, I don't know how to deal with that because it should have not. But there you go to hear the cool theme song to my new book. Um, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, like like panel one of the book, we see the shot of the town, and it is more than possible that every rumor of a sea monster is just that someone saw that lobster claw, claw silhouetted by the sunrise or something. Mm -hmm. Like just that—that's just a rock formation that's sitting out there, and that's how. And everything could have just started from that. Of course, it doesn't, well, because I want to have an actual sea monster because I like sea monsters. Mm -hmm. This book features nothing inside a sea monster. That that picture book will also, will also never get made. And this book gets to be a loving tribute to my favorite ceramic fish, which I'm sure I talked about last time on, when I was on here, but um, there's a fish in a fountain outside my office in Hollywood that is the ugliest, most poorly designed thing I've ever seen. And I'm completely obsessed with the fact that it sat there for a hundred years and so many people could have said no to it and no one ever did. And it's this fish with this big like gaper of a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I would always walk past it and I'd say to people, I bet someone's fucked that fish. And people would say, Richard, that's disgusting. No one's ever fucked that fish. And then one night I was coming home and I was coming back to my office to do more work because I'm cool. And it was like two in the morning and I came in through the back gate and I heard God a noise. Damn, Richard, don't, don't tell, was it, it was someone else? So, yes, no, it's not me. <laughs> I was like, I was like, Richard, Richard. I, I came in and I was like, I was like, hey, sexy. Um, no, I come in and this guy is like, going to town on this fish's mouth and it like nothing about it looks comfortable like he's in a cement fountain it like there's nothing about this is good so i just sit on the on the bench opposite the fountain and watch him he's like what are you doing i'm like you don't get to ask me that sir i'm not gonna <laughs> miss seeing this happen because no one has ever believed me that it would mm -hmm. so i'll wait till you're finished but uh, this is an experience i need to have i i just it was it was perfect. And the next day I walk past that fish. I take a selfie with this fish every time I go past it. I walk past him and I look down and um, and there were no cobwebs in the mouth that morning. And I was like, I know why. I know what I saw. Between me and you fish, I know exactly what happened here this night. <laughs> mm. So we decided to have like a lot of these beautiful ceramic fish. That fish is also, it, it appears in Haunted Hill and is the cover of issue two of Haunted Hill. <laughs> so That's like, so awesome. I love this fish is stupid fucking fish and in the right book here, uh, it gets nicknamed busy fish lips 
here are uh, some of the add-ons as well. So are these uh, other creators from the Blue Fox uh, label? Yeah, so they have this huge back catalog of, of, of great books. Um, and you can get like huge bundles of them and, and, and all kinds of things. Um, I have been backing their books for a couple of years now. I, I've never had anything bad from them. They do wonderful retellings of Lovecraft stories, but with all of the uh, shitty racist stuff uh, rewritten to not be. Um, like, let's have the cool monsters without the terrible stuff. Uh, and they also do a lot of like original horror stories and uh, like quite quite nice, quiet, emotional pieces. Um, my favorite book from them, which I talk about all the time, is a book called Fishing Memories. And it's about uh, an old man with Alzheimer's inside his own mind, finding pomegranates that he can hold on to uh, and feel like he's getting some memory from them for a minute, but then he has to throw them into this thing that he has to, he has to feed them to this thing and they get burnt up and eaten and he loses the memory again. And it's just, it's just absolutely beautiful. That's, I, I just love the way your mind thinks, man. You have such like a, a creative imagination. Like it's, it's in, it's remarkable. Well, that that one wasn't it. mine. That was, that was a book I read from them. So if you're buying an oh. by fishing memories, it's, it's my, my favorite book that I've like. My, oh my, my God. I thought you wrote that. I was like, I was like so mesmerized just by the, like, that you no, described I'm, me. I'm, I was like, dude, holy crap. This is good. I'm so jealous that I didn't write that. Like I'm, I'm over here writing my like. Everyone looking for Bigfoot's fucking, you know, like <laughs> Bigfoot getting fucked. <laughs> Bigfoot's not getting fucked. That's, again, you think I fucked the fish? You think people? No. My thing is, I think if you are going to the woods to look for a monster that definitely doesn't exist, it's so you can have secret sex. Like, oh yeah, I just need to go to the woods with my friend every weekend to find a monster that I'm definitely never going to find. They're having secret sex. I that's what I'd do if I lived near Why the woods. Why not just get a tell at that point though because you can't cover up your secret sex if you have like you have to you, you need the the artifice of the search for bigfoot to have all the secret sex and so my story starts from the point where they accidentally this this um secret gay couple who have been very much in love going to the woods every weekend to have secret sex and not hunt for bigfoot accidentally kill bigfoot and then they have to take him back with them and essentially like look after him for a week and it puts their secret relationship to the test because now they have like more than just sex in a tent they have the responsibility of raising a child or a metaphor for raising a child together <laughs> which they never really <laughs> and it's it's my favorite thing i'm so excited to eventually have time to draw that <laughs> that's not, it, it, dude that sounds i love that i love that so much let's go ahead and remove this and start wrapping things up Mm -hmm. So after going through that Kickstarter for anyone that might be on the fence about backing, what would you like to say to them directly to help push them over that fence? If you like something that'll like just creep you out, something that'll stay with you, this is this is the book. Like it is atmospheric horror. And I know that I've like said a bunch of goofy nonsense about circling, swirling narratives and all of this sort of mm -hmm. garbage and told stories about watching someone fuck a fish. Uh... <laughs> When I'm on paper, I'm a, I'm a reserved and careful writer. <laughs> it's an elegant fish on paper, no worries. <laughs> if you want, like, it, it's, it's, it's funny, it's weird, and it's, it is it is creepy. Uh, everyone, like, we, we, okay, not to brag, but we keep getting reviews where people refer to it as the best horror story of 2022. So, uh, that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. I mean, my first thought was, oh, I've had other horror stories out this year. You didn't notice them. But I'm like, no, Richard, they're complimenting you. It's okay. Um, talk yourself down just to, just for a second, you know. Um, no, if, so if you like if you like good spooky horror, if you like something a bit weird, uh, and if you like really just, I had a lot of fun drawing a lot of wrinkle-faced old ladies and a, mm -hmm. and a big complicated ghost train i didn't see th this is the thing after all of this i still end up with a pier with carnival rides on it including a very complicated ghost train roller coaster and uh and big wheel thingy what, what's that called the big wheel ferris wheel ferris wheel thank you um so you know i didn't get out of any of it it turns out <laughs> at least you had to do a little less though right it wasn't like the whole book was yeah that's true it was it was just uh Two uh, two out of the six chapters were set on a fully built pier, and actually the ghost train was one of the most fun things I've drawn in like years because I got to do this um, big splash page where they're winding through it, so you see their cart oh, and like, so cool. places through the train, 
and you know i, I love I, I love ghost trains especially the ones where it feels like a full environment that you could really like climb out of the cart and wander through mm -hmm. no yeah. i love uh i love the type of ghost trains you could suplex like the ones in final fantasy 6. richard's like what are you talking about <laughs> the other day i i tried to make a joke about how young and hip i was because i was talking to someone who was like two years older than me and i was like uh, I, I, I reference skitching, which is where you skateboard hitch. Yeah, yeah, on a car. Yeah. Yeah. And no one had any fucking clue what I was talking about. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry you guys aren't hip like me. And then while I'm talking, I'm like rapidly Googling skateboarding terms so I can just start dropping them in like that. Dropping them in. Like yeah. Them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, then, and then at one point someone was like, well, Richard, if you really want to get into this lingo, you need to play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. And I was like, funny, you should mention it wheeled on over to the other side of the room forgetting that i'm on a zoom call and in my underwear and it really does rely on me being you know this close to the screen mm -hmm. um so they saw my cool uh reptar shorts um and i <laughs> grab i grab this copy of tony hawk pro skater 2 that is covered in dust and still sealed in plastic and they're like yeah you gotta play it if you want to learn things that you can't just buy a playstation and pretend you're cool no, that is, I, dude, I remember uh, when I was a kid, um, my uh, sketching story, uh, my buddy and my me were convinced my mom somehow to go down an old old road, uh, and we're hanging on the seatbelt straps uh, out the back, it was a van, and um, I remember he jumped off his board, we were going like 20, 25 miles, which doesn't seem fast, but when you're on a skateboard, that is <clears> extremely fast, and she just kept going, his board <clears> shoots out in front of me, and I'm like, I hit the ground, I'm like dragging, oh man, no hospital though, I just... <laughs> <laughs> that was back in the day where it's like, okay, let's glue part of your hand back together. You're good. You're good. Mm -hmm. Ride this mm -hmm. out. So speaking of writing it out, let us start wrapping things up before we ride this out too long and finish this on a strong note. Richard, you've been on the show before, so you know the drill. Um, anytime we have a creator on the show, we love show you know promoting their book, showcasing everything and themselves as creators. But there are likely new people who are watching. So with that being said, for anyone who is new and struggling getting going with just the process, what type of advice would you offer them to kind of help them get motivated just to begin writing or even just doing art? Uh, for writing, I would say just write bad stuff and don't worry about whether it's good and just do it regularly. It takes about 28 days for your brain to form a new pattern. So if you just write 500 words that are garbage every day after 28 days, you will get to that point in the day and you'll go, oh, it's writing time now, and then it'll be easier. Uh, two, uh, if you're doing if you're if you're doing comics, just finish a comic. Write a write a comic script. Do not get hung up on the idea that you have to hire an artist and make it real. Just get some paper and draw it badly. I don't care if you can draw or not. I couldn't draw when I started, and now I can. But whether you want to be the person who draws the comic at the end or not doesn't matter. You should know how to do every single part of it. It'll make you a better writer. If you are an artist, if you are a new artist and you're starting out, work on paper. Do not work digitally when you're learning, because if you are learning digitally, you will always be able to undo and you will always work toward an idea of what you think is correct. And you will never learn to adapt to mistakes you've made that are stuck on the page because you're working in ink. And like that adaptation that your brain starts doing is what will make you an interesting artist doing like that is how you will find your style much faster. It is fine to switch to digital later on, but like work on paper as much as you possibly can. That is, I, I've never really heard that piece of advice and, and, and the reasoning is, is, is awesome. I, I would have never thought about that either. Like the ability to like force your mind to learn how to adapt and, and learn from those mistakes and, and make still make a you know a, a salvageable picture from it because mm -hmm. here's the thing there's no such thing as like a ruined picture it's just hey your picture has a new piece of black ink there let's figure out what it's going to be i love that, I love that mentality. Like the fix is bad. sometimes it ends up being absolute dump city garbage by the end of it but like still worth trying no, absolutely. That is awesome. Richard, thank you so much for that remarkable piece of advice. Everyone watching, be sure to check out uh, Shut In. If you're unable to back, like I said, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter. Word of mouth is 100% free and it's going to help get this book out farther and farther. That being said, it is time for us to wrap up. I have to get ready to get my little youngins from school, my little uh, geeks and geekettes, and to get ready for the day at karate. Richard, I hope you have an awesome day. Thank you so much for swinging by. Um, dude, this has been an me. awesome Monday. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Everyone I'll, I'll watching, be back soon with another book, I'm sure. Please, I cannot wait to get you back on again. Everyone watching, I hope you have an awesome Monday, but most importantly, guys, keep it geekly.